Good afternoon. Welcome to BizTech's Asian Midday Market Watch. It is the 1st of April today. Happy April Fool's Day and to Easter Monday to everybody out there today. I'm Jeffrey Halley and today we welcome Vishnu Varathan, a great friend of the show, but also in his day job, the Head of Economics and Strategy at Mizuho Bank in Singapore. Uh, Vishnu, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Um, always good to be here to chat with you and uh, I think no better day, better day than uh, April Fool's Day to see you know, who, who, who's fooled by the data, I suppose. <laughs> well, hopefully neither of us will look uh, foolish either. Uh, let's just uh, have a look around Asian stock markets as, as per usual today. Uh, there is some impact due to holidays, so uh, both Hong Kong, Australia and New Zealand are closed and we'll see some European markets closed today as well. But uh, looking around the markets, the Nikkei 225 has fallen by 1.1% uh, uh, today, but Shanghai is up by just about 1.1%. Um, down in uh, South Korea, the Kospi has rallied by 0.23%. Uh, with uh, Singapore up 0.63%, with Kuala Lumpur climbing just a smidgen under 0.5%. Uh, Vishnu, it, it seems to be a bit of a, a mixed bag today. I mean, holidays aside in Hong Kong and, and, and in Australia, um, we've had the Tankin data out this morning, uh, but we've also had PMIs from both Japan and from uh, China. So. Is that impacting uh, the stock market moves today? Yeah, I, mean, I think markets are still really digesting the data that's come through. In the headline, um, the data are you know, more or less upbeat. We've got an uh, outrun in, in both measures of uh, China's manufacturing PMI, whether it's for the larger firms or the smaller firms. Duncan mm -hmm. as well, you know, uh, sort of outperformed. Uh, uh, but I, I think where some of the reservation comes in is perhaps with regards to the Tankan, uh, two aspects of it, it's fairly uneven between the larger firms and the smaller firms. Yeah. And even with the capex uh, of, of Tankan, I think it undershot expectations. So essentially, uh, the, the, the slightly better outlook doesn't seem to be translating into investment spending that causes the kind of, uh, or not to the same, uh, same degree expected, uh, that causes the virtuous cycle, so to speak. Uh, for China as well, I think the jury is out because uh, there, there does seem to be an upturn coming through that's aligned with and, and you know, corroborates with the bottoming in, in the global manufacturing. Uh, but it's still too early to call uh, an unfettered uh, and, and strong rebound because many factors remain up in the air, including the property market, uh, as well as geo-economic factors, which uh, could easily dampen some of this optimism that we, we see here. So I think markets essentially are digesting all of that alongside the fact that the Fed didn't get too excited uh, about the PCE data. So basically the Fed is saying, look, for now it's going to be a non-event because we're not getting too agitated by a hotter CPI, but, but you know, equally, we're not going to jump the gun on cuts uh, with slightly softer PCE either uh, because they've got the comfort to wait and watch. Uh, so in, in aggregate markets, know uh, that there, there may be some reason for optimism, but perhaps not exuberance. Right. When we look at currency markets, though, there seems to be some divergence here to my mind as well. The yuan, the Chinese yuan, has been quite weak over the past uh, week, uh, if you'll pardon the, the paraphrase there. Uh, and, and China seems to be comfortable tolerating a weaker yuan. Whereas on the other hand, dollar yen, the yen has fallen above 151. Um, where dollar yen has rallied and, and that has sparked uh, quite a bit of watching the markets closely comments from the Bank of Japan, which is usually a, a prelude to intervention. So, um, I mean, what, are you, what is your feeling about uh, the Chinese yuan for a start? I mean, I can't imagine there's much lee room, uh, much room for the Chinese to play here before the currency manipulator slash sort of competitive devaluation uh, people in Washington, D.C. start coming out of the woodwork. No, no, that's, that's a really good point. So our, our sense is that, uh, you know, the, the Roman B, uh, I, I think the PBOC is watchful of excessive 
uh, downside weakness. We saw some of that coming through last week in the way they were setting their fixing, ensuring that they can backstop it, but they're not too fussed about it in so far that because of the onshore fixing, they're able to rein in uh, the Romimbi, or rather rein in the weakness in the Romimbi as necessary. And mm -hmm. I don't think to be too, um, you know, uh, uh, too troubled by uh, the, the emergence of uh, trade hawks uh, uh, with regards to currency manipulation, because for once, I think we can say there is an alignment of interest. In fact, China would like to see a slightly stronger and stable currency that is broadly in line with dollar trends. So from their script, it's going to be, look, this is not renminbi weakness, it's dollar strength. It will reverse mm -hmm. out in tandem with the global trends. Uh, and I think they're comfortable to be there for the time being. And, and you know, of course, that's until another head drops. Uh, but in, in sharp contrast, and, and you brought this up really well, is, is the yen. Uh, so the Japanese yen has taken quite a bit of a knock. And I think why policymakers are sounding a little bit more concerned uh, and, and in fact sounding the alarms about possible intervention is because the currency uh, has defiantly traded in a mm. diametrically opposing direction to what the BOJ is signaling. So BOJ is signaling, look, we'll do calibrated tightening, but the currency is trading as if the BOJ just went on to slash rates and perhaps <laughs> expect uh, So I think they want to stop that kind of uh, you mm. know, speculative that's that mount pressure uh, on the BOJ, whereas um, there's also the psychological impact of being at 30-year lows, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and so these are the factors that I think would weigh on the BOJ. And, and, and having said that, I think it's worthwhile mentioning that uh, markets ought to fully expect a very vigilant uh, and, and, and possibly hands-on MOF. And, and so that ought to keep speculators within uh, uh, you know, uh, more confined parameters. Mm. Interesting times. We saw Indonesia's inflation come in, well, quite a bit above what was expected in my mind today. We've talked about stickier inflation than markets are pricing in before, but that leads me into, we have an OPEC meeting this week. Now, Brent crude has hit five-month highs, according to my charts, this morning, and obviously higher oil prices don't have great implications for lower inflation. But are you expecting anything, any fireworks from the OPEC meeting uh, th th this week? And do you think that these higher oil prices could start, really start impacting on, uh, on, the, on the lower inflation narrative? So, so for the OPEC meeting, it seems like, you know, the, the clenched fists and the uh, gritted teeth will continue. Uh, mm. Price are very welcome. But I think the OPEC plus remains very circumspect about letting the curbs uh, slide now uh, in case it, it, it involves prices slipping back. I mean, let's bear in mind, it's no longer relevant to talk about the break-even production cost for Saudi. It's more like the fiscal break-even cost, which is perhaps an arguably uh, Brent well over 85, if not $90. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's one way to frame what to expect out of the OPEC. Uh, in terms of the inflation impact of oil, it's going to be more an inconvenience uh, than it is a, a policy deal breaker. So it, with all things equal, without a, a huge geopolitical flair that sends oil, say, another 20-30% higher, uh, the bumpier disinflation path ought to remain intact, as will uh, plans for mid-year to Q3 rate cuts to come through from the major global central banks. So that's the relief. But as you rightly point out, there's going to be a lot of uh, discomfort elsewhere, including Indonesia. You know, despite being a coal exporter, they are reliant on crude uh, imports and it's going to be uh, really inconvenient for Bank Indonesia, given the uh, dynamic between the rupiah and uh, the and inflation. And, and it's all both headed the wrong way. So the rupiah downwards and inflation upwards with some mm -hmm. negative or adverse feedback there that makes uh, Bank Indonesia's policy making far more constrained. Uh, compared to maybe, you know, if you flash back to six or nine months back, where we thought Bank Indonesia would have a lot more space. Mm, no, not at the moment. And we can see that dollar rupee is actually up about 0.4% today after that inflation number, possibly for exactly that reason, the constraints that Bank of Indonesia will have going forward on policies. We are seeing a lot of uh, jobs data coming out uh, this week as well. We've got the US jolts numbers, 
But I guess that the, the highlight of this week is going to be, and it seems to be rolling around faster and faster these days, is uh, non-farm payrolls. It's that time of the month uh, for the first Fridays and, um, you know, the uh, US non-farms. Are we expecting any surprises um, from, from, from those this week? Not a major surprise. I think we, are, we probably would be quite comfortable to say, look, the numbers are probably going to be well above, uh, I won't say well above, but, you know, north of 200K. Uh, and that's pretty much what markets have come to expect, which is why the Fed is forced to sit on its dovish hands uh, for the time being. Uh, the ability to, uh, you know, splice this data and say, you know, some of this is due to immigration, whereas wage pressures are, in fact, uh, you know, uh, starting to ease. That narrative will probably take uh, another couple of months to come through before the Fed gets comfortable with the cut. And, and so uh, NFP data might be a case of, um, you know, uh, a bit of uh, 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 queasy watching, but really nothing fresh to watch there. Mm -hmm. Typically uh, good for some short-term volatility. Absolutely, why traders can make money. Yes. <laughs> In theory, but I've seen plenty lose over that too. Uh, Vishnu, look, uh, thanks so much for your uh, time today. And, uh, we wish you a, a wonderful week ahead. Thank you, Jeff, and you. We've been speaking to Vishnu Varathan, Head of Economics and Strategy at Mizuho Bank in Singapore on BizTech's Asian Midday Market Watch. I'm Jeffrey Halley, and this video and podcast will be on our website, biztech, www.biztech.asia, as well as our social media platforms and also our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Thank you.